Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our webinar titled An Introduction to Isolated Langendorf Heart, Experimental Considerations and Best Practices. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. This session is sponsored by AD Instruments and will feature Dr. Melanie White, who will discuss isolated Langendorf heart principles, key experimental design considerations, and best practice tips to support consistency and validation of your research. Dr. Melanie White is a member of the Charles Perkins Society, a Heart Foundation Future Leader Fellow, and teaches senior students in the discipline of pathology at the University of Sydney School of Medicine. Hi, Melanie, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Liam, for having me. I'm really looking forward to talking to everyone today about the Langendorf perfusion system that we use. Um, but I thought I'd start first with a little bit of a historical background. So there was a lot of work being conducted in Germany around the mid 19th century regarding basic physiology, specifically the idea that physical and chemical forces were driving physiological responses in a more pragmatic and mathematical manner. And this was the ideal of a man by the name of Karl Ludwig. And it, this was particularly during his time as the director of the Institute of Physiology at the University of Leipzig. Preliminary experiments that were conducted by Ludwig and one of his colleagues, Wilde, um, used the heart and the aorta of a deceased animal and they were able to connect this to the carotid artery of a living animal. And this really set the stage for the isolated heart experiments that we'll go on to discuss today. So after this, Elias Sion pioneered isolated uh, frog heart perfusions while working at the Litz Pig Institute of Physiology. The advantage of the frog heart is the presence of only one ventricle and the absence of coronary circulation. They found that with the heart excised, the aorta and vena cava cannulated, where they were able to supplement the frog heart with rabbit serum. And this allowed Scion to test the response to changing temperatures, providing early observations for cardiac excitation contraction coupling prior to the discovery of the roles of calcium and sodium ions in this precise process. Beyond this, Ludwig modified Scion's preparation, producing a non-recirculating system where the cannula was passed from the atrium into the ventricle with an additional cannula passed into the ventricle to measure gas pressures via a mercury manometer. The frequency and amplitude of contractions were measured using Ludwig's own invention, the chymograph, and this formed the foundation for what is known as the bow ditch or the trip or the staircase effect. However, the first mammalian um, preparation wasn't performed until Henry Newell Martin. Um, optimized the system that used a both a heart and lung excision. It wasn't, however, until a preparation by Oscar Langendorf, which was published in 1898, that we formed the foundation of the ex vivo perfusion techniques that we still use today. In this system, Langendorf cannulated the aorta for perfusion with defibrillated blood from the respective species, be it cat or dog or rabbit, which he used quite a lot. In this aortic cannulation that results in what's known as retrograde flow, what we see is the aortic valve will shut, thereby preventing flow of that flow into the left ventricle. Instead, the perfusate passes from the aortic root via the ostea into the coronary vasculature to permit physiological function. And this is a real key to the retrograde flow. And this was one of the many significant findings that have been made using this ex vivo system, including the respective cardiac effects of things like potassium chloride, muscarinic effects, and also atrophine. Whilst numerous adaptations were made to the original setup made by Oscar Langendorf, including the measurement of inflow rates to determine coronary flow rates, development of constant pressure and constant flow systems, the principles of that Langendorf perfusion do remain constant to today. However, the last major shift in ex vivo perfusion was made in the 1960s by James Neely and Howard Morgan, where they returned to a system that saw cannulation of both the atria and the ventricle, creating what is known today as the working heart system, where the flow of the perfusate is physiological. Importantly for retrograde systems, Neely and Morgan implemented the use of a modified Krebs-Hanslet bicarbonate 
buffer, which is supplemented with oxygen. So what are some of the principles that are key to Langendorf perfusion? Obviously here we're relying on coronary circulation and this is what is required to maintain physiological contraction rather than discrete filling of the chambers. Here we're using retrograde perfusion. In other words, we're going against the physiological direction of flow, forcing the aortic valve to shut and that diverts the flow into the coronary ostia in the aortic root to perform necessary perfusion of the coronary circulation. For this to occur, we require oxygenation. Perfusate systems are designed to mimic the plasma ionic content. Obviously, we need a source of carbon, and this is up to the individual experiments. But also, we need oxygenation, and we need to maintain physiological pH of 7.4, and also physiological temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. We'll also deliver the perfusate to the heart via either constant pressure or constant flow. And lastly, the system is largely free of influence from other organs. And this is really what I see as its main advantage. Without those other organs, humoral factors and autonomic innovation, we are able to see actual cardiac specific events and effects. And for most, if not all scientific applications, there are obviously limitations. And I will try to address some of these shortly. However, the Langendorf system is an incredibly well-studied system and it is well accepted in the field of cardiovascular basic science as a way to investigate numerous cardiac pathologies in a really precise manner, including myocardial ischemia, ischemia reperfusion injury, hypoxia, and also pharmacological interventions. So what are some of the um, systems we can use? Obviously, these are all perfusate systems. There's three main ones that we're going to talk about today either crystalloid-based, whole blood perfusion, or an erythrocyte preparation. So when we talk about crystalloid perfusions, we're mainly talking about Krebs Hanslet buffer, or KHB, and it's the most widely used perfusion buffer associated with Langendorf perfusion. It contains those ions that are going to mimic the plasma content, so things like sodium chloride, magnesium sulfate, potassium phosphate, sodium bicarb, and calcium chloride. The buffer needs to be bubbled, importantly, with not just oxygen at 95%, but also some carbon dioxide. And it's, it's the carbon dioxide that is necessary to maintain that physiological pH of pH 7.4. It is important to note that the physiological uh, levels of these ions needs to be considered when developing an experimental protocol. Most of the components of the KHB will actually be at supraphysiological levels for example, calcium and potassium. And we need to make this a consideration before we actually start our experiments. Obviously, we're providing an exogenous carbon source for cardiac metabolism. The most popular choice, of course, being glucose. However, this is too supplemented at a super physiological level. And depending on the biology in question, it can influence functionality, especially when things like glycolysis is a contributing factor. Pyruvate can also be used as a carbon source, as well as free fatty acids. However, there can be some solubility and foaming issues with these last two carbon sources. Lastly, given that Krebs Hanslet buffer is a protein-free system, the oncotic pressure is significantly lower than physiological levels, increasing the total tissue water, which can effectively simulate an edemic situation. This is further exacerbated by the superphysiological flow rates required. In the absence of hemoglobin, the oxygen carrying capacity to the vascular bed can also be decreased relatively. Even in light of these supposed limitations, the crystalloid perfusion system does remain popular, mainly because of the low cost associated and the reproducibility of the production of the buffer systems. Secondly, whole blood perfusion systems. The advantage that this system um, offers is the ability to maintain a perfusion system that is nearly identical to the physiological setting. By setting up whole blood perfusion, it can be significantly more challenging by comparison to those crystalloid perfusion systems that I just mentioned. The main drawback of this system is that it originally suffered from an incapacity to re-oxygenate the blood after ejection from the ex vivo coronary circulation. To circumvent such an issue, a donor animal can be used, 
to essentially reoxygenate the blood. This recirculation also means that the blood must be inline filtered, which can pose additional issues. Flow rates in the whole blood perfusion system are significantly lower. However, there is a significant risk of hemolysis or blood cell breakdown, and the humoral effects of the donor animal can have an influence on the ex vivo heart. Conversely, when we consider that the perfusate coming back from the ex vivo heart may contain contaminants, this can have an influence on the donor animal. And these are considerations that need to be, need to be addressed as factors in developing experimental protocols. Lastly, the erythrocyte perfusion uses a mix of bovine sources for red blood cells, an addition of the crystalline buffer, Krebs Hanslet buffer, but also albumin as well as an oxygen carrying protein. This results in a perfusate system once again that is able to maintain physiological osmolality as well as oncotic pressure. We also find that the hearts that are subjected to erythrocyte perfusion do maintain physiological perfusion rates for a much significantly longer period of time. However, once again, there's an incremental cost increase in this system, and it's an incredibly laborious procedure involved to actually make the perfusate. The next thing we need to consider when developing and describing our experiment for Langendorf perfusion is whether we choose to use a constant flow or a constant pressure system. And ultimately, it relies on the biological question we're trying to ask with our Langendorf setup. Constant flow setup is particularly useful for low flow models of ischemia and also pharmacological studies. Constant flow allows for really good consistency across experiments. However, we do see that it won't allow for changes in perfusate flow rate to allow for autoregulatory mechanisms. So in this way, what, we what we're talking about is if we've got a situation where we have an increased workload, so we need more perfusate, the flow rate won't actually increase because the pressure isn't increasing. Or if we have a period or we have an area of regional ischemia that reduces the functionality because of a change in the capillary bed, that flow won't be changed as well. In the later case, the same flow rate is being forced through a much smaller mass of the tissue and that can ultimately elevate the flow per gram of tissue, which we don't want to do. Alternatively, we can use constant hydrostatic pressure and we can achieve this by placing a perfusate reservoir or a bubble trap at a predetermined height to maintain a preload and an afterload pressure. Work done by Shaddock developed an electrical feedback system which has allowed for much more precise perfusion pressure recorded at the junction block just, ad just adjacent to the heart and that allows for the control to be achieved by the peristaltic pump and it also allows for a switch between constant flow and constant pressure. In this particular case, it's important to realize that we're measuring both flow and pressure, and it allows us to visualize how perturbations in either parameter has an influence on the other parameter. So the usual flow rates that we're looking to achieve are in the range of eight to 12 mils per minute per gram of heart weight, um, which is significantly higher than physiological levels. So this is obviously regarding our crystalloid perfusate. So if we consider a mouse, we're looking at a lower limit of 1.5 to 2 mils per minute and an upper limit of around about 6 mils per minute. With rat species, we're looking at a lower limit of around about 10 mils per minute and an upper limit of 26 to 28 mils. With rabbits, a lower limit of 35 mils per minute and an upper limit of a, up to 80 mils per minute have been recorded in some circumstances. So some important considerations when once again designing our experiments is what species we'd like to use. There's a lot of work that's been done in the smaller rodent models, mainly mouse and rats. And the main reason for this is the low cost of housing. But there are some challenges that are associated and that's mainly in the size of the vasculature that we're going to try to cannulate in this system. Alternatively, we can use larger rodents like the guinea pig, but also small mammals are quite a popular choice as well. Here, obviously, the advantage is the vasculature is significantly larger 
However, the handling effects are significantly more important with rabbits. They don't like being handled much at all. And obviously the cost to have an, a single animal is uh, vastly more expensive than those associated with smaller rodent models. We also need to consider sex differences. While there's no significant differences between male and female animals with normoxic functionality, females can have smaller infarct zones if we're considering an ischemia reperfusion injury setup. I like to say that we only ever use males or females and we don't ever have a mixed sex population. We also need to consider age differences. When we look at the left ventricular developed pressure in normoxic perfusion and post ischemia, we do see differences in age groups. And this we can also see with sex effects as well. There will also be a change in the flow rates as animals become older. So obviously this has an additional influence if we have our setup as a constant pressure system. Lastly, we need to make sure we choose a single anesthetic. There are multiples of that, uh, multiple different anesthesias available. Uh, the two main groups are either inhalants or injectable anesthesia techniques. And with our injectables, we're either going to use an intraperitoneal or an intravenous mode of delivery. So I wanna show a video here and I do apologize, it might be graphic. Um, and if there are sensitive viewers, it will only be a minute, um, but it really, it's designed to show you how the heart is excised. And this is on a rat model. So we need to ensure that we've applied a deep anesthesia. And to do this, we need to check for an auditory response, but also a pain reflex. And we normally do this on the foot pad. We uh, use barbiturates and that's rather common in the field. But it's important to understand that there's a really narrow therapeutic range for the barbiturates to, to apply a deep sedation as opposed to re responding in cardiorespiratory suppression. So we need to be careful with this. We apply heparin to reduce clotting of the blood supply. Um, that can either be delivered during the sedation, the deep anesthesia, or it can be um, applied separately. And lastly, we need to uh, perform a thoracotomy. And it's the thoracotomy and the incision into the diaphragm that is used to expose the heart, the great vessels, and actually lead to the death, the ultimate death of the animal. Okay, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna cannulate the heart. Obviously, as part of our excision procedure, we need to dissect the aorta above the root but below the aortic arch. And this will allow us to have a good amount of the aorta to allow us to perfuse the aortic sinuses, which allow um, for opening into the left and right coronary circulation. We place the heart in a cold cardioplegic solution to limit the effects of the hypoxic period, which which occurs just because of excision of the heart and prior to hanging of the heart on the rig. Then we will cannulate the aorta and it is easily the most challenging component of the procedure and it will ultimately depend on the size of the animal. So if you've got a larger animal, it's significantly easier to cannulate the aorta. However, once ligated on the cannula and securely ligated, we can increase the flow rate and the perfusion can commence. And what you can see in the video is just above our organ bath, we've placed a small square of parafilm with a small hole. And that's just in case our ligation hasn't been completely effective and it stops the heart falling into the, um, the reservoir, which if you have to pull it out of the reservoir, it takes additional time and it means we're not perfusing the heart for additional periods. You can see here that we're also doing the majority of our trimming um, on once the heart is actually receiving full perfusion. And that's because our main goal is to get the heart out of the animal and get it perfusing. So we'll do all of our small and fine techniques once this has occurred. So you can see here, we're just trimming away additional, um, additional tissue, which would put additional, uh, 
force on the heart. It would drag the heart down the aorta, um, creating additional pressure. And what you'll um, what we'll eventually see is we'll um, just twist the heart and we'll start getting ready to insert the balloon into the coronary, into sorry the left ventricle, and this will allow us to monitor the pressure that is developed, um, both the systolic pressure and also the diastolic pressure. Okay, so we always use a baseline period, and these baseline periods traditionally run for 15 to 20 minutes. This allows for the washout of, this, of the metabolites that are being produced from that small ischemic insult when the heart is being excised. And those metabolites can actually be toxic to the heart once it's being properly perfused. So it also allows us to observe how the heart is functioning at an individual level and whether we can include it in our study beyond this point. And these exclusion criteria are incredibly important for perfusion studies. Not all hearts will behave the same. And it's important to know that there are biological influences that will come into play with our heart will respond on the Langendorf perfusion rig. Once ligated on the cannula, we can increase that flow rate and we can commence that perfusion. And what we can see here is a big zoom out of our full 20 minute baseline period. And you can see that once we've inserted the balloon, we're starting to record both our systolic and our diastolic pressure. Here we have our left ventricular developed pressure, which is simply taking our systolic and minusing our diastolic pressure from it. And down here we have our rate pressure product, which is a calculation based on our left ventricular developed pressure and the heart rate as well. And you can see here that we've only had a few little arrhythmias, which is fine. This heart would definitely be included in our study. So what sort of functional outputs are we looking to measure? Obviously perfusion pressure, and we have that up the top here. Some people also call the perfusion pressure the aortic pressure. And this is what is developed by having a closed system. We also look at the flow rate. And you can see here in this particular case, we had a constant flow setup. We're also going to look at the heart rate. The heart rate is measured in this pink line. Unfortunately, I've taken away the scale. We will also measure the diastolic pressure and the systolic pressure. We also have the capabilities to record an ECG or an EKG, which gives us an idea of how the development of the action potential is occurring. We can calculate using the algorithms within the software, the left ventricular developed pressure, which allows us to get an idea of the contractile force within the heart. And we can lastly calculate the rate pressure product, which is this last window down here, which once again, is a mathematical modification of the left ventricular developed pressure multiplied by the heart rate in beats per minute. So we like to use an exclusion criteria and it's important to understand that there's a minimum exclusion criteria, but also a maximum exclusion criteria. For our minimum exclusion criteria, it would be time between excision and perfusion being greater than 120 seconds. And this is excision. It's not delivery of the anesthetic. Keeping in mind that the animal doesn't actually expire until we uh, break through that diaphragm. We also use an exclusion criteria that defines the rate, that uses definition from the rate pressure product. And here, if we have an RPP less than 26,000, we would tend to suggest that the heart is not performing adequately, even at the end of that baseline period. If the heart requires less than 10 mils per minute to, uh, to have an adequate perfusion pressure, this would also be a reason for exclusion. Lastly, if we have numerous arrhythmias, and you can see here on this particular heart, we would probably exclude this heart from our statistical analysis. That's because of the number of, uh, of arrhythmias towards the end of the baseline period. It's probably not going to respond well to whatever period of ischemia that we're about to deliver to it. If we are to zoom into this region, you'll see that um, we actually get a lot more detail and we can see that these are alternons. So there's a change in the uh, calcium handling within the left ventricle that's creating these arrhythmias. 
So some of the limitations and the caveats to Langendorf perfusion, obviously there will be a decline in contractile and chronotrophic function over time. And using a Krebs-Hanslet buffer or a crystalloid buffer, this has been estimated to be around about a 5 to 10% drop in contractile function per hour of perfusion. Typically, we're looking at a brachycardiac heart, and that's in comparison to the normal in vivo heart rate. In vivo situations in the mouse system, we're looking at a bit, uh, beats per minute of up to 420. Sorry, and that's in the Langendorf system. However, in a physiological in vivo system, we're looking at up to 600 beats per minute. In rat, in the Langendorf system, we're looking at a maximum around about 320 to 350 beats per minute versus 400 beats per minute in an in vivo setting. So for this particular reason, some researchers choose to use a pacing um, setup to try to increase and maintain a physiological beats per minute situation. Obviously, we also need to understand that there is some limitations in the clinical viability of ex vivo perfusion. That advantage in insofar as we're only looking at the cardiac specific effects, we're not looking at humoral effects or the effects of other organs. This does have limited clinical viability, but it just means we need to test it in a more complex system, the results that we get from these Langendorf experiments. The other clinical viability question that we need to understand or we need to be aware of is the viability of the model used. When we're looking at our small rodent species, as we've just discussed, their heart rate is, can be as much as 10 times higher than what we would expect in a clinical situation. This also has influences on how quick we have contractile cycling as well. So these are just considerations we need to be aware of. And once again, we can circumvent these kind of limitations by taking our Langendorf experiments and testing them further in a more clinically viable manner. Lastly, using the perfusate and recycling it can actually cause, cause issues insofar as it's very similar to a metabolic acidosis situation. And that's because of the release of lactate from the heart in response to that very short ischemic insult when we're taking the heart out of the animal prior to starting the Langendorf perfusion. Okay, so if we have a look at this one, this is our Langendorf in action. We personally use pentobarbital and we deliver it as an intraperitoneal injection. We look for a loss of the pain reflex on the foot pad and we firstly will deliver the heparin into the renal artery. So it means we're actually doing a peritoneal surgical procedure prior to opening the diaphragm. Once the diaphragm is opened, we obviously will reflect the ribs and allow us to have good access to the heart and the great vessels. Once we have excised the heart, we're going to plunge it into an ice cold saline solution. We try to minimize our time from the opening of the diaphragm to the hanging to around about 90 seconds, but at a pinch, we'll go to 120 seconds. We maintain low flow. So in the rat model, we use two mils per minute until the aorta is absolutely secured by at least two sutures. We will, after this point, gradually increase the flow rate until it's around about 13 to 15 mils per minute while we insert the balloon into the left ventricle. Once we have that left ventricular balloon filled, we will establish a constant pressure system. We will also do 20 minutes of baseline to ensure that the hearts are stable and that they have recovered well from the excision process. But importantly, as far as setting the balloon, we also we make sure we set it up with an afterload of around about 10 to 15 millimetres of mercury. This is important because as the heart relaxes on the Langendorf, after going into some level of contracture, that diastolic pressure will actually decrease with time. And it should have established its bottom diastolic level within that baseline period. So it's another reason to use that baseline period. 
So my group, we're using the Langendorf system and we're using techniques beyond that, which are termed proteomics. And we use proteomics to allow us to understand cellular adaptations to two main things, myocardial ischemia reperfusion injury in otherwise control hearts, but also how the cell adapts, how the myocytes adapt to type 2 diabetes. We use proteomics to help us develop a hypothesis in the most unbiased way possible. We're not going in with a question. We're allowing our hearts to define our follow-up candidates. So what is the proteome? The proteome is the protein component of the genome. In other words, what is translated? And this really is one of the closest points to the physiological function that we can monitor. The genome has an influence, but the proteome will have a greater influence and the metabolome will actually have an even greater influence on the function of the heart that we are able to observe using the Langendorf perfusion system. So proteomics allows us to sample across the cell, but it, importantly, it only takes a snapshot of the cellular response, and it's a snapshot at that exact moment. And it is in response to whatever extracellular stimuli we have applied to the cell. However, it's important to understand that the limitation to proteomics is that its utility becomes limited beyond four orders of magnitude. So here we're talking about dynamic range effects. So what are some of the key proteomic processes? I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but it's more just to give you an idea of how we've chosen to use the advantage of the Langendorf to our advantage for the limitations and the techniques that are associated with proteomics. So obviously the first thing we'd like that we need to do is we need to solubilize our sample. And to do this, we'll use detergents, denaturants, and we'll also reduce our disulfides and then alkylate them to give us better sequence coverage of the protein. We can separate our, our proteins based on uh, SDS page, which allows for molecular weight separation, but we can also separate on the basis of PI which is using isoelectric focusing. This actually gives us two-dimensional separation of our proteins based on their PI and also their molecular weight. It's, these days, it's not as popular a technique, but it still, has its, uh, it still has its uses. After this, we'll digest our proteins so that they're amenable with our downstream techniques. And we'd normally, our enzymes of choice are either gonna be trypsin or lysine and lysine. Beyond this, we can separate our peptides to give us good orthogonality uh, and provide our population the greatest space to be analyzed by our downstream techniques. And to do this, we can, either, we can use technologies including size exclusion, which obviously separates on the basis of size, hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity, which is using the, the chemistry of the peptide in question, and same with strong cation and anion exchange. Once again, we're relying on the chemistry of the peptide of interest. We can do relative quantitative approaches. Uh, the, main, uh, the most uh, prolific ones being SILAC or TMT and ITRAC. Uh, there are also some great advances in label-free approaches, which can be very interesting. But obviously, we've got to actually understand what protein we're looking at. And to do this, we use a technology note that is broadly classified as mass spectrometry. For the majority of the cases that we are looking at, we use liquid chromatography with tandem MS, which allows us to sequence the peptide that the protein has arisen from. And it gives us great detail in these situations. So we apply our Langendorf perfusion to investigate multiple cardiac pathologies. The ones that I've listed here are ones we have done in our lab over the years. The first one being myocardial stunning, where we're inducing a short period of myocardial ischemia, followed by reperfusion, normally around about 15 minutes of ischemia. We've looked at acute myocardial infarction, where we increase that period of ischemia out to 30 minutes and also 60 minutes of ischemia as well. We've done some biomarker discovery uh, experiments, and I'll actually go through that one today. We've looked at the role of reactive oxygen species by using a scavenger for ROS, in particular MPG, and we've applied that to our Langendorf system. We've looked at how the, the cell changes. 
we've looked at an ischemic time course with our Langendorf system. Here we're looking at short periods of ischemia, but also long periods of ischemia and seeing how the cell adapts to that ischemic insult. We've then applied it again to a reperfusion time course where we've set a minimum uh, ischemic insult of 15 minutes and then increased the reperfusion time at which we cut the heart down from the Langendorf cannula. We've used the Langendorf to investigate pharmacological interventions, as well as pre and post conditioning with ischemic insult following. Lastly, we have investigated diabetic cardiomyopathy using Langendorf perfusion. So I mentioned that I wanted to just discuss one of the reasons we actually like, we really rely on the Langendorf to help us delineate what's happening in the cardiac myocyte cell environment. So as I mentioned, the proteomic techniques that we use, they can be limited by samples with a broad dynamic range. When you consider what the heart is designed to do, it's designed to pump. The majority of the dynamic range is made up of contractile element proteins. So your myosins, your actins, troponin as well. After that, we start to get into the mitochondrial proteins, and that's because the myofilaments need a continuous source of ATP to allow for continuous contraction. So you can imagine when we're doing our proteomic techniques that our ability to see low abundant proteins that aren't either associated with the contractile filament or the mitochondria can become difficult. But then when you complement that with the fact that the heart has a very large volume of blood comparatively, then we've got additional dynamic range effects from the blood that is also in the heart. Albumin is one of the biggest problems that we always face in a proteomic study. So our aim in this study was to define a better biomarker of ischemia reperfusion injury than the ones that are clinically available today. So our approach in this particular paper was to collect perfusate after ejection from the heart as a very rich source of coronary specific biomarkers that were being released in response to exactly what we'd done to it. And in this case, we were either looking at 15 minutes of ischemia or 60 minutes of ischemia. The methods that we used, obviously Langendorf was incredibly important to this experiment and also our proteomic techniques. So what I wanna show you here is a two-dimensional gel image. And you can see up the top here that we're separating our proteins on the basis of their pH and also their molecular weight. And what you can actually see is this is perfusate that's been collected from the heart. And if we circle them in red, what you can see is that our most abundant protein, albumin, even though it's still there, it is coming down in its relative abundance over our normoxic period from at the end of baseline, which is 20 minutes after hanging, 30 minutes of normoxic perfusion or 75 minutes. So albumin's coming down and we're getting wash out of additional proteins as well. So it really means we're able to start looking at proteins that might be released from the heart in response to what perfusion protocol we do actually use. So if we change it up and we have a look at what our hearts secrete in response to 60 minutes of ischemia or 15 minutes of ischemia, you'll see that this same profile, while it's largely there, is starting to be complemented with proteins that are being secreted from the heart. And it really changes the protein profile. And we know that these proteins are only being secreted in response to that ischemic insult because we didn't see them with our normoxic treatment. So what we chose to do was we chose to follow those classic clinical biomarkers of myocardial ischemia, including creatine kinase, lactate dehydrogenase, and myoglobin, as well as troponin I. Then we chose to also look at some of the ones that followed a very similar temporal profile. And the one that became incredibly interesting was this protein here known as CSRP3. By doing a Doppler, we were able to show that CSRP3 was being released in a very similar temporal profile to troponin I. The issue with troponin I is troponin I will remain elevated in serum samples well beyond the resolution of the ischemic insult in clinical patients. And that's why we started looking at CSRP3. And what we can see down on panel D is a small clinical cohort of patients that have been um, 
subject to a small ischemic insult because of an angioplasty procedure, and we can see CSRP3 is being released in these patients. And as the period following um, reperfusion, those proteins actually wash away. So it gives us a good idea of those patients that have recovered well, which is important clinically. So some of the lessons we've learned from the Langendorf, obviously there's lessons we've learned about the heart. The most important one is the condition of the animal. If the animal is stressed in any way, that has a great ability to influence the function of the heart. If it's diseased in any way, that will also influence the function of the heart. And these are things to keep in mind. If your heart is not performing at the end of baseline, have a look at the cadaver. There might be some sort of indicator that there's an issue with this animal that wasn't otherwise detectable until we did a surgical procedure. We find that heparin is incredibly important, especially in small rodent models. And that's because any kind of blood clot is akin to an ischemic insult. We find better contractility is maintained throughout a perfusion protocol when the heart is submerged in that warm buffer, be it crystalloid or additional buffers that you may choose. We find that it's important to ensure you can see the end of the cannula if you were to gently touch the heart and you could see it through the aorta. If you can't see the end of the cannula, it might indicate that it has perforated through the aortic valve and that's going to influence your system. We do use homemade balloons. They are tricky, but because you can change the size, it's well worth the effort. And lastly, practice is key. This is not an easy technique. A lot of it just comes with time. So practice, practice, practice. As far as the lessons we've learned from perfusing, it's important to keep dedicated glassware. Don't swap glassware, don't use it for other purposes. If it's for a buffer, it's always used for that single buffer. The choice of water source is incredibly important. If your hearts aren't making it through baseline, try your water source. <laughs> Everything needs to be filtered and it needs to be filtered repeatedly. That's because once again, especially if you're using a small rodent model, even small particulates are akin to an ischemic insult. And the same can be said for air bubbles. And for that reason, we use an inline air bubble trap. We also want to ensure appropriate cleaning protocols. That goes for everything. If there's any kind of bacteria or mold, that could lead to cardiotoxic effects. And we, you should also consider cleaning your air stones. That's really important. And lastly, to ensure we maintain our flow rates for as long as possible, not on a single experiment, but over experiments, it's important to release the tubing from the peristaltic pump. It's just putting additional pressure when it's not in use. So just to point you towards some reading that will help solidify the uses, the benefits, and what sort of key decisions need to be made in the process of addressing Langendorf setups. These are some of the references that I would point you towards. And I'd like to acknowledge the people in my lab, Desmond Lee in particular, who is the skilled hands you can see in the majority of my videos, Lauren Smith, who developed the type two diabetic model. And in the Cordwell lab, Alistair Edwards and Ben Parker were particularly instrumental in developing our Langendorf system. And I was supported by a future leader fellowship from the National Heart Foundation of Australia. All right, thanks so much, Melanie, for all the fantastic insights so far. And with that, we're just gonna move on to the Q&A session. So our first question today comes from Juan Carlos, who asked, does the study of isolated heart remain a valid method to study coronary vascular reactivity? And what are the advantages of this method of experimental study? It's a really important question. And although it's outside my area of expertise, what we can do is consider that coronary function, which is measured by Langendorf, relies on the coronary vascular reactivity. So therefore, it would seem that it is still an appropriate and valid method to study coronary vascular reactivity. 
Obviously, the advantage of this method of an experimental study is that the coronary vasculature is not going to be responding to additional factors like those humoral factors that could be released in an in vivo situation. But in this particular case, maybe something like a crystalloid perfusion cyst, uh, setup would be ideal so that we don't have any of those humoral effects that may come from a whole blood perfusion system. Okay, perfect. Uh, it sounds like we have quite a few researchers with us who are new to the technique, and we've had a few variations of this question, but Lauren asked, what are the biggest pitfalls for researchers who are new to this application? Do you have any recommendations or details that you wish you knew when you first got started? And what aspect do you find most challenging surrounding Langendorf setup and data acquisition? We've been using Langendorf now for the better part of oh, 20 years. Gosh, where's the time gone? And without a shadow of a doubt, it just takes time to become proficient. You can't shortcut it. There are no shortcuts. It's about how the experiment feels in your hands. It's not going to be the same for every uh, person performing the experiment. And that's one thing I would say. If you are doing a long-term study, make sure it's always the same pair of hands doing the experiment. There's nothing worse than having to look at a series of hearts and try to understand what the difference is. And it just comes down to a different experimental, uh, a different person conducting the experiments. Obviously, the condition of the heart, that's not something you're actually going to know until you actually excise the heart. Animals aren't great at letting us know when they're not well, but we have a better chance of understanding that after we've excised the heart from the cadaver. The last one, and this is something we learnt the hard way. Keep your perfusate reservoirs closed. You can introduce so many sources of dust just by having those reservoirs open. So keep them closed at all times. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. In your presentation, you mentioned that uh, cannulation can be very difficult and we have had a few questions come in about it. Uh, so, Melanie, what do you recommend when removing the heart and keeping it in the best condition possible? So, uh, maximum cannulation time, uh, or cooling the heart before removing it, uh, and so on. Yeah, this is really important. And as you mentioned, we did sort of touch on it in the presentation, but we the time period that we're looking at is not the time from the injection of the anesthesia or from inhalation of the anesthesia, it's from opening the diaphragm. These animals have only been heavily sedated until that point. It's opening of the diaphragm that, re that removes that negative pressure in the pulmonary cavity that leads to, to the death of the animal. So that period, it should be measured from the opening of the diaphragm to the hanging of the heart. And we really do try to keep it as short as possible. And it's for this main reason we actually use the rat model rather than a mouse model. Obviously, with the mouse, the vasculature is significantly smaller. In the majority of setups using mouse models, you need a dissecting microscope to really make sure you are gently and carefully opening the aorta for cannulation. And it's incredibly tricky, and that will increase the amount of time. So in that particular case, you wanna make sure you have that cold cardioplegic solution and incredibly delicate hands as well. These aortas, while they're elastic to a degree, they are very, very delicate. And we need to be really careful with that. Perfect, okay. Um, now here's a good question that came in actually during registration. Uh, Gonzalo Peluso said, it takes me three minutes between euthanasia and starting the perfusion of the isolated heart. Uh, do you think this is a good time in order to reduce the damage of the heart because of ischemia? Well, once again, it comes back to uh, incision through the diaphragm rather than the period of euthanasia because different animals will respond differently to the euthanasia. Some of the animals will go down quite quickly. Some of them will take a little bit of time. And that's totally dependent on the animal. And that's why it's key to record that time period from incision within the diaphragm. So three minutes, if it's um, from euthanasia to perfusion, you're doing really well. 
if it's three minutes on something larger than a mouse from incision into the diaphragm and hanging, it's starting to get a little bit long. And it just comes with practice. And keep in mind, as I showed in the video, that you can trim um, the excess tissue away from the heart once it is being perfused. That's always an option to reduce that time period significantly. Okay, great answer. Um, a next question here, Dieter said, I sometimes struggle with slow effluent flow rate when using a constant pressure system, uh, 70 millimeters of mercury, uh, which makes me concerned that I'm not optimally perfusing both coronaries. Any tips on how to improve this? And is it always necessary to puncture the pulmonary artery? So when we think of flow rates, obviously we have our flow rate into the heart and we have our flow rate out of the heart and they won't be matched. And that's part of the, I guess, the improvement that was made on Oscar Langendorf's original Langendorf setup, that they weren't necessarily looking at the effluent flow rate. They were only looking at the affluent flow rate. So as far as the system is concerned, if you're developing pressure, if you're developing a system pressure or a perfusion pressure of 70 millimetres of mercury, you've got a closed system. You're probably going to be perfusing both of those coronaries, and I'd be happy with that. I mean, if you're worried about increased in pressure and they're not being sufficient effluent, consider something like heparin if it's not already being used. There could be small blood clots that could be elevated, that could be artificially elevating that perfusion pressure without actually allowing for appropriate perfusion of the coronary bed. There could be multiple things happening. All right, perfect. Now, here's another good question from registration. We're having trouble maintaining steady diastolic pressure, and specifically, we see a decline when we use an LV pressure balloon. So initially we suspected leakage, but it still happened after we ruled that possibility out. Any advice? Definitely. We always um, see a drop in the diastolic pressure and we account this to that small period between excision of the heart and hanging of the heart, which is essentially a small ischemic insult. And what the heart is actually doing is it's going into a level of contracture. So by putting the balloon in with a small diastolic end load, what we're doing is we're allowing the heart to relax around it. So for a small decline in diastolic pressure, it's totally accepted. And that's why we, in the RAT setting, we would normally set our, our diastolic pressure to between 10 and 15 millimetres of mercury during the baseline period. And we've got that baseline period to see how that diastolic pressure is reducing. We definitely don't want it to go into negative. It makes it difficult to calculate an LVDP, but that's why we have it there. We can always reinflate the balloon if we find that the diastolic pressure has dropped a little bit too far. So it's a consideration. Okay, excellent. Now, Melanie, I know you talked a bit about this during your presentation, but maybe you could just elaborate. Uh, the question is, do you have any advice on defining exclusion criteria? And what are the right parameters to be included in a protocol of ischemia reperfusion for a Langendorf experiment? Yeah, we definitely have minimum parameters, but it's also important to uh, consider maximum parameters. And we saw this for a small period in our group as well. So our minimum parameters, which we discussed in the presentation, uh, we're looking for a flow rate that is, that is too low for that equation that we discussed. Um, so in our RAT system, if we have a flow rate of less than 10 mils per minute, this is indicative that the heart may not be ready to appropriately respond to say an ischemic insult. Um, same with the rate pressure product. And we use the rate pressure product because that allows us to consider both the LVDP as well as the heart rate in our consideration for an exclusion criteria. But as I mentioned, not only is it important to have a minimum exclusion criteria, but also a maximum exclusion criteria. I mean, when you consider the fact that a lot of the time we're considering how the heart responds by comparison to our end baseline period, if you've got let's say a rate pressure product above 45,000, it's gonna be incredibly hard for that heart 
to recover to anything close to that. So there's some sort of extra factor that's happening in that heart. Maybe there's too much calcium that's allowing it to um, contract with significantly more force um, that's responding in a maximal parameter, which should be considered for exclusion. So definitely minimum and maximum exclusion criteria are important for Langendorf experiments, but especially for ischemia reperfusion, where we're looking at how they recover following that insult. Okay, fantastic. Um, here's another question. What is the importance of blood gases, lactate, isotonicity, osmotic pressures, and so on? And how do these affect heart function? Without a shadow of a doubt, they definitely have the ability to influence the performance of the heart. Uh, my background isn't so much in blood gases, but as I discussed, especially with things like lactate, um, because lactate will ultimately change the extracellular pH, if we don't wash that away, that has the ability to create like a metabolic acidosis situation. And that has the ability to really significantly influence how the heart perfuses on the Langendorf system. So considering that we're aiming for a, P, a physiological pH of 7.4, if we have too much lactate in our system, that's going to significantly drop that pH and that's going to influence things like the force of contracture, but also the heart rate as well. Okay, perfect. Now, in the interest of time, we'll just make this next question the last one. When perfusing with erythrocyte containing solutions, do you have any advice on good measures to prevent hemolysis? That's a really good question. And one we are actually about to come to. Uh, in the past, we've only ever used crystalloid perfusion systems. And we're only now starting to think of moving across to erythrocyte containing solution. And that's simply because of the additional hands-on nature that's required. So if you have any advice to, to share with us on good measures to prevent hemolysis, I'd be really happy to, um, to have that chat. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Melanie, for all the fantastic information, both in your presentation and the Q&A session. Thanks so much, Liam, and thanks everyone for joining us today.